Debbie's dad is 91 years old, lived quite a long life. He was in the hospital for about a week, maybe a little bit more than that recently. Uh, they actually were pushing oxygen into his lungs. At 91, when you're in the hospital and having trouble breathing, you know what you start thinking of? Your life is not going to go much longer. And actually, Paul, while he was laying there, thought that they had done some extreme things for him. And so he actually was saying, I think I'm going to tell them to shut the oxygen off. And then he did this. And then you sit there like that with Debbie next to him. And he actually expected that he was not going to make it home. Well, this last week he came home. Debbie's uh, been down there for the last three nights or something like that, uh, trying to help take care of him because there's a lot of work trying to help him with oxygen and all the other things that he has. Um, but, but Dad, Dad's really troubled right now. How do any of us prepare for death? What's really troubling him right now is that his nephew Clay and his brother-in-law Dick and the rest of Dick's family have not made commitments to Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I'm watching Dad and he is, he's nervous, he's uptight, and he's like, I've, I've, got, I've, got, to, I've got to say something. I've got, I, and he told us about a note that he had written for Clay that he wants him to read because he feels like Clay is the most open to Jesus. And he's saying, Clay, you're the spiritual leader of the family and you've got to reach the rest of your family. He's looking for tools and all and that he can share with them because he wants them to be in heaven. And he's concerned that he's about to die and he doesn't know if he has another chance to share Jesus with them. last couple of days I've been over to see Pete and um, yesterday Ann said she doesn't think that Pete's going to last another day but he's a strong guy and he's, he also is really troubled right now in fact um, he was he got up the other night and was in so much pain and they've got him on heavy doses of morphine he went to the front door and he was wanting to go to the hospital that he was in so much pain ended up on the floor got him back to bed and then on I think it was, it was Friday evening he started saying the book the book the yellow book the yellow book the yellow book and he's, and he's I mean he barely talked anyways and he kept to, he getting really upset about this finally they remembered that he had come home with a yellow book from the church office it's a little book that we're going to give out next Sunday for Easter and it's the book the case for Christ and answer book and in it is questions and answers about is Jesus did Jesus rise from the dead is he the Messiah and he said and then he pointed and said Vanessa read it to me Vanessa is the one of the two twins Jessica just got married Vanessa is the other twin the one that Peter says is dis is far from God what is he troubled by right now? Peter is troubled that he's afraid he's going to go to heaven and Vanessa won't be there. And Jesus was hanging on the cross. And in our text, Mark 15, verse 37, it says, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Most people don't have a loud cry when they breathe their last breath. So many that I've seen die, and we have an expert here who's been a nurse, hospice nurse, and on. he's seen probably more than I, maybe. But um, so often there's not this loud shout or something like this. John 19 kind of tells us, though, what, what Jesus probably cried out. In verse 30, it says, When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished! With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
Now it was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. Interesting, it comes from either side, then they come to Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of, the dis one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. Who is it? It's John himself saying this. These things happen so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one who they have pierced. The word, it is finished in, in the Greek, is one word. It's not it is finished. It's tetelestai. Tetelestai. It's an ancient word that, that we've found most people say it means to be paid in full. It, it's when a task that's completely done, it's the cry of the winner, tetelestai, I've finished. It's, it, it's, uh, the tetelestai is one that's in the perfect tense, by the way. And a perfect tense, I don't normally do grammar for you because I don't do well at it, but I just got to tell you, perfect tense means that it's a past act that's finished with present effect. Did you get that? A per the perfect tense is a word that a past act is done, it's finished, it's not going to be done again, but it has a present, a present effect. Someone said it's emphasizing that the past completed event of Christ's death on the cross has ongoing, even permanent effects. Jesus' sacrifice may have, have occurred in time and space, but its results will last for an eternity. I tried to study some of the places that tetelestai has been used. A slave would come to their master when they finished a job that they had been given, and the, sl the slave would come to their master and say, Master, tetelestai! I've completed my job that you gave me. A prisoner in a debtor's prison, when the, the judge would say, okay, you've paid your debt, and they signed the document, the parchment, to allow them to leave, on that document it would say, tetelestai, paid in full. Priests, this is interesting, priests would actually use this when they were examining the lambs and the other sacrifices to see, are they ready, are they perfect, are they clean, are they unblemished? And if they were unblemished and they were adequate for sacrifice, then the priest would say, Tetelestai. It's complete. It's ready. Yes. Uh, here's one. Sculptors and painters. They'd stand back and they'd look at their piece of art and then in, what would they say? Tetelestai. It's finished. Colossians 2.14 says, Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He has written over our debt for sin. What? Tetelestai. It's finished. It's paid. Debt is paid. Gabalene said, Never before and never after was ever spoken one word which contains and means so much. It is the shout of the mighty victor. And who can measure the depths of this one word? Tetelestai is not just the cry of a dying man. It's the cry of triumph. Of a living, life-giving redeemer. A divine proclamation that the work of redemption had been fully, finally, and forever accomplished. Luke 23, 46, Jesus called out with a loud voice. And Luke doesn't say the word, he just says, he called out with a loud voice, like Mark said. He, he said this loud, spoke loud, and then he gave up his spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. And Mark, Matthew 27, verse 50, and when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. Do you hear the same thing in the Gospels, even though they're different? In one, it is finished! And he bows his head and gives up his spirit. Mark, and with a loud voice, he cried out. And he bowed his head. Matthew, 
And, and when he cried out with his last voice, he gave up his spirit. And Luke, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. They all go together. What's Jesus saying? I, Jesus, excuse me, Father, Father, I finished the job. I came here with one purpose in mind, and that purpose was to redeem humanity. That purpose was to pay the price that they couldn't pay. And Father, Tetelestai, I've finished. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. John 10, verse 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it again. And this command I received my, from my father. I'm doing what you said, Father. We're finishing it right here. Tetelestai. And at 3 p.m., Jesus died. Verse 38, Mark 15. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. By the way, I'm going through Mark 15, so if you have your Bibles, that's the passage you want to open up to and just kind of keep your finger there as I jump to some other verses that follow on. But the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Some, by the way, say that 3 p.m., Deuteronomy refers to as the time between the evenings that, that actually Exodus even says take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight this is the Passover, the Passover lamb they're supposed to be taken care of until when? until the afternoon of Passover some say that would have been 3 o'clock in the afternoon at the moment that they've just declared the Passover lambs and sacrificed them is the moment the Passover lamb dies on the cross. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple. So where would the priest have been? Right outside this curtain. The Sanhedrin's there. They're, they're right there in the temple. And, and God tears the curtain from top to bottom. Early tradition says that the temple curtain, the curtain that was protecting the Holy of Holies, was a hand's width, possibly four inches or wider, that thick of a curtain, 72 squares that were all put together. And this curtain, an earthquake would not have separated this. God himself rips it. And notice, Mark is really clear in this, from top to bottom the curtain is torn and the holy of holies is open for view and Jesus makes it possible for us to enter because he just died on that cross it's Hebrews 4:16 let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need or I like the way that the living bible says it so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. <laughs> Can you imagine what this did to the Sanhedrin? To the priests as they're standing there in front of the Holy of Holies. And none of them are allowed in there except for the high priest once a year. And that's coming up. Once a year. And now here's the Holy of Holies with the curtain ripped apart. And God is saying, come in. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Because I've finished the job and I've made it possible for you. Continuing in Mark, verse 39, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. What was it that moved the centurion to say, surely this man was the Son of God? What, is, what did he see? He didn't see the temple curtain being torn, did he, from top to bottom? 
He's not over there. He's not watching any of that. He doesn't really even care a lot about what the Jews believe. But what has he witnessed? Well, he was there present at the meetings with Pilate. He probably helped transport him to Herod and back to Pilate again. He's listened to the crowd. He's watched him be silent. He oversaw the scourging of Jesus, the whipping, the tearing apart of his flesh. He has actually led the crew that's taking him to Calvary and guided them in the crucifixion of Jesus. He stood there to oversee him and to make sure that he suffers and dies. He's listened to what he's been saying as he's been hanging there on that cross. He's watched the darkness for the last three hours. He's experienced the earthquake and he's seen him breathe his last breath with the words, Tetelestai. What did he see? Well, that's interesting. This Roman centurion would have had a different view of God than the Jews, wouldn't he? His view would have been that Caesar was God and that there were many, many gods. So why does he say this? Some make the comment that, that he's actually being sarcastic, which is a possibility. <laughs> Look at him! Just like they've been saying, if Elijah was here, you know, why doesn't he bring himself down? Look at what all these people have been saying about him. <laughs> Surely this was the Son of God. Or is he saying it like this? Oh my, I have not watched a man die like this. And this centurion is an expert in crucifixions. And he's seen people beg get down off that cross and he's watched Jesus as he's breathing and struggling to serve, to live and he's listening to the things that he's saying he's standing right there he, he's hearing it all he's, he hears the conversation between Jesus and John and Mary behold your son behold your mother he's heard him say looking right at him father Forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he realizes he's speaking of him. He's heard the ridicule, all the, the mean-spirited sayings, and he hear, hears that, Father, forgive them. He's, he's heard him say, Oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's seen the spiritual and emotional anguish in the eyes of Jesus. He's heard him say, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he's witnessed that final breath as he cries out in victory, not defeat, tetelestai. Yeah, he might have been being just sarcastic. But he may also have been saying, I have witnessed something today that is so incredible that surely this must be the Son of God of God. And Jesus said, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And is it possible that a centurion was one of those drawn to him? Mark will continue. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. Who's there? The ladies who have taken care of Jesus. They've uh, actually, it's amazing. It's the ladies who have funded the journeys. It's the ladies who have cooked the meals. It's the, the ladies who even have provided personal and prayer support and caring support. It's the ladies. It's the ladies who are standing there watching all this as the disciples have run, right? It's the ladies who are there. And among them is Mary and Mary Magdalene, the, the, the woman who had been brought up out of adultery, uh, uh, being a prostitute. Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, is standing there. And these women are all there weeping and caring for one another. And they had been the ones who had taken care of Jesus. And Mary's not alone, though, is she? She has these other ladies, these women who have been with her and with Jesus as he's ministered out in Galilee. They've cooked meals, mended clothes, financed the ministry. 
and they're not afraid to be identified with Jesus. Verse 43, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that he, it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. The cross turns quiet followers into bold men. The centurion has said, yep, he's dead. He knows. Back to John 19 again. Now it was the day of preparation. The next day was to be a special Sabbath because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. They actually had a large wooden mallet. When the person was hanging there on the cross, if they wanted to let them die quick, they would take and shatter the knees, both legs. Because of that now, now the person no longer could push themselves up to get breath, and they soon would suffocate and die. And then when they came to Jesus, they said Jesus was already dead, and they thrust a spear up into his side. Why does he do that? And why does John emphasize this? He thrusts a spear into his side, and water and blood comes out. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm one of those who believes that that was a significant thing. That the, uh, now I just lost the word, the perikineal, how do you say it? <laughs> the, the heart area where the heart is kept. Para, pericardium? You all know what I'm talking about, right? It's where, where the, the heart is encased here in the, in the chest cavity and all. And so a spear goes up and notice this man's down here. Jesus is up here and spear goes up into his side. And then John says that water and blood poured out. Why would that happen? Because inside that chest, what I believe was taking place, and medical people say this, was that his heart had already burst. And when the heart bursts, now it mixes with water and blood in the cavity. Because, you know, dead people don't bleed. You know that, right? But when the spear goes up in there, piercing this hole in the peritoneal chest cavity, Water and blood both pour out. How did Jesus die? He chose to die on a cross, and he dies with his heart broken. It is finished, and his heart breaks, and water and blood pours out. Exodus says that the Passover lamb is not to have its bones broken. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Exodus 12, 43, These are the regulations for the Passover meal. No foreigner may eat it. Any slave you have bought may eat it after you have circumcised him. But a temporary resident or a hired worker may not eat it. It must be eaten inside the house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of the bones. The whole community of Israel must celebrate it. Psalms has the same prophecy. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, Psalm 34, verse 18, and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. And they took Jesus' body down off the cross, and they carried him to a tomb, an empty tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, who has now come out of the dark. Has he made it known that he's a follower of Jesus? No, it doesn't seem that way. He and Nicodemus, who came in the middle of the night, who, who quietly questioned Jesus to see, how do I get born again? How does this come to me? 
both of these men now, the cross changes us, doesn't it? The cross turns these two men who are probably afraid of the rest of Sanhedrin, turns them into bold men who not only make it known publicly, I'm now going to follow this, this Jesus Christ, but they're going to take his body down. They risk even persecution themselves by Rome. They risk the danger of going to Pilate himself. Can we have his body? Because you see, the tradition was you leave the body hanging up there. They didn't care about what the, what the Jews thought, although Herod, excuse me, Pilate had gotten in enough trouble with other things he had done to offend them. It is the Passover. But normally, you just let the body hang up there. You don't take it down. And if you did take it down, you simply threw it on a rock pile and you let the dogs and the other animals destroy and eat it up and it deteriorate. But Jesus... Jesus has these two men who boldly come and say we want his body it's just hours literally hours minutes maybe before Passover is going to begin before sundown before the Sabbath Shabbat starts and so they've got to hurry and so they quick put spices around him wrap in this linen cloth put him inside this tomb close it with a big rock and Mary Magdalene Mary the mother of Salom's watch and see where his body was placed. I want to remind you of what the death of Jesus Christ accomplishes. Jesus' death breaks the power of death itself. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. The fear of death is natural, isn't it? How many have experienced death and understand what it's like? And you've gone to the other side and come back. It's interesting, most who have that kind of an experience come back with a peace about death. But most of us haven't, have we? And the, and the fear of death is natural. But Jesus wants to free us from both the power of death and the fear of death. And I watch Peter and I watch my father-in-law, Paul, and I see an anxiety. But it's not a fear of dying, although there's, there is concern there. Peter says, I don't want to leave Anne alone. And he's obviously concerned about Vanessa knowing Jesus. Paul, some time back, said to the whole family, I just want to make sure that when the saints go marching in, you will be there. That's his burden right now. Will his brother-in-law, his sister... His nieces and nephews, will they be there in heaven as well as the rest of his family? Jesus' death breaks the power of death. Notice who had the control. Hebrews says Satan had the power of death. Revelation says the last enemy to destroy it is what? Death. And Jesus, number two, Jesus' death takes away our sins. Thank you, God. John 1.29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Hebrews 9, verse 22, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. The copy was down on here. The true one's up in heaven. The real temple's there. The place of sacrifice is there. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. The high priest goes in there, has to sprinkle blood on the altar in the holy of holy places. And if the high priest was cleansed before he got in there, he'll live and come back out. And if not, they'd have a rope tied to him and they pull him out because he's going to die from, because of his own impurities. And what did I say? 
tetelestai is in the perfect tense. It's a completed action with effects for us today. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was, was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Because Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. Jesus' death reconciles us with God. Romans 5, 8, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by God's wrath through him? Remember we said last week, the darkness for the three hours is the judgment of God. It's the presence of God judging his own son, pouring out his wrath upon him. For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation we are made as if we've never sinned because of what Jesus did For Ephesians 2 but now in Christ Jesus you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier the dividing wall of hostility the curtain has been torn there's no longer anything separating us from the throne of God and he continues by setting aside his flesh the law with its commands and regulations his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. We deserve God's judgment. We deserve God's wrath. And Jesus takes care of that on the cross. For Jesus' death proves that he was fully human. Somebody said, Jesus died. Duh. No. Jesus died. The centurion gives evidence to that. The spear up in the side, just in case maybe he had missed and was, was because some people say, oh, well, he didn't really die. He swooned back to life in the cold tomb. So he didn't really rise from the dead because he never died. Excuse me? He died on that cross. He's not breathing anymore. And a spear is going in and totally proved that this man is not alive. Jesus' death proves he was fully human. Why does that also matter? Not only because of some of these theories that try to make up for a false saying that he didn't really die and he, therefore he didn't rise from the dead. Because if he didn't die and he didn't rise from the dead, then guess what? Then we have no salvation. And frankly, 1 Corinthians would say, well, what we're doing here is really to be pitied because we're wasting our time. But Jesus died. There was a, a teaching that, that went on for several centuries and it's this teaching called docetism. And it was the view that Jesus did not come in flesh and blood, but as some kind of spirit being. Well, if you're a spirit being, then you can't die, can you? You also don't bleed, and a spear won't harm you. Jesus died. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of